So, here's humans, here's chimps, bonobos, gorillas, and orangutans. You can see all the apes of today, right? All of the apes of today. We all live with each other, right? We're not, we're all apes. But what happens is, if you go back about a million years ago, you see that chimps and bonobos share an ancestor. And if you go about five, six million years ago, you see that humans and chimps have a common ancestor, right? Right here. This is our ancestor that we branched out into, right? So one population went this way, became humans. The other population split and went this way and became the chimps and bonobos. Then if you go back further, about 12 million years ago, we see that we share ancestors with gorillas. And if you go back about 12, 13 million years ago, you see that we share, all of us share a common ancestry. And this is uh, Proconsul, one of, the, one of the first apes. So again, the reason why there are still apes is because every ape is different. We, we each took our different paths, right? All of our evolutionary paths were different. But we all share a common ancestor about 14, 15 million years ago, all of the great apes. And that's how evolution works. Evolution is a fact. It really happens. We observe this in the fossil record. We have the fossils, we have the DNA to prove this. This isn't just some random idea. This is a fact. Yeah, these are humans, these are chimps. And you can see the reason why we're close together is because we share much in common. Humans are essentially most pretty much chimpanzees, glorified chimps. Or a little bit smarter. That's it. Everything else is almost the same. We are not apes. Yes, we are, we are apes. Humans are apes. We are apes. We have ape fur. We have eight brains, eight physiology, eight fingers. Look, these are eight fingers. Right? Just like the chimp fingers, just like the gorilla fingers. Very similar. Look how similar they are. Um, we don't have tails, just like all the other all the other apes. They don't have tails. They have tail bones, but no tails, no long tails. Um, they have fur like we do. We're apes. That's it. We're still evolving. Exactly. And every one of these is evolving. Nothing stopped evolving. Right? It's not that humans are the end of evolution. We're not the, we're not the end of it. We're always evolving. We still are. We always will be evolving. It's going to happen forever. As long as we're alive, we're going to evolve. As long as we have DNA, we're going to evolve. Just like all the other apes, they're still evolving too. Right? It's just going to take many generations, many, many, many thousands of generations to see the big changes. Monkeys have tails. Yeah. That's why we have a tailbone. That's exactly why we have tail bones. Because again, if you go back to this picture, you see that we share common ancestors with uh, our ancestors were, were monkeys about 20, uh, 30 million years ago, right? Yeah, about 30 million years ago, our ancestors were monkeys, right? Before that, they were mammal, like shrew-like animals. Before that, they were reptiles. Before that, amphibious. Before that, fish, before that, uh, insects and worms, bacteria and protocells. And this is, this is 4 billion years of evolution condensed, right? So when, when you look at this picture, this is 4 billion years of evolution condensed into one picture. So it looks crazy. But if you recognize how it works, the process of evolution, you realize that this is, um, what we see in the fossil record in their DNA. This is how we evolve. That's amazing. It's quite incredible. This is a theory. No, this is a fact. This is a fact. We know this happened. We can see it in our DNA. We can see it in the fossil record. We didn't come from monkeys. We did. We did. We did come from monkeys. We are apes. We are apes today. Humans are homo sapiens, which is a species of ape. We are apes, right? If you go to the first thing, that first living thing ever, right? That's a protocell. 
which is a very simple RNA-based molecule, right? Amino acids linked together into peptides, right? Chains of basic amino acids, uh, nucleotides, things like that. Basic, basic uh, proteins and amino acids. And that's what makes the first protocell or the first RNA molecule, the first living thing. And from there it became more complex over time and the chemical evolution. And then natural selection happened. The survival of the fittest, the fittest one survived, right? The reason why there are changes is because when you're a species, when you're out in nature, you have to survive and you spread your genes, right? Every generation is gonna be different Every time you have a child, they're going to be a bit different than you, genetically, a little bit different, right? And your child is going to have children too, and they're going to be a little bit different than them. And this, if this process keeps going on and on forever, you know, eventually you're going to get a vastly different species. And what drives evolution is natural selection, right? If you can survive in your environment, you get to spread your genes. And the ones that don't survive, they die off, right? So it turns out because of nature, the ones that are fittest to survive in their environments, they survive and they spread their genes. That's why it seems like there's a progression here because there's a process that's driven by nature itself, the environments in which we experience, right? For example, uh, fish had the precursors to fins, they had fins, which are the precursors to arms They had uh, and legs, right? So these proto-limbs were able to develop in amphibians because um, those fish were driven to leave the oceans, leave lakes and ponds and go on to land just a little bit. Perhaps they mated there. Perhaps they laid eggs there. Perhaps there was food there, right? There was some natural resource there, some natural reason why they had to leave the oceans and go on land. And as you see, this, this process goes on and on for millions of years until you get such a vastly different thing like humans. Evolution doesn't happen this fast. Oh, no, of course. Yeah, it takes, it takes many, 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 many generations. But this is, again, this is 4 billion years of evolution condensed into one picture. So remember, this is 4 billion years. That's how long Earth has been here. Four billion years of changes, small incremental changes, slowly but surely become different. Simple things become more complex things over time and over enough mutations. Okay. How do humans come from reptiles? So about 600 million years ago, there were no land animals. Land animals didn't exist. There was no trees even. Trees didn't exist 600 million years ago. But around 400 million years ago, things began to live on land. They began to leave the oceans, leave the waters and go on land. And those became the first amphibians. The first living things on land were, well, they were fish-like and amphibian-like. They had mixtures of both properties. But the point is, that they resembled these kinds of guys, right? Proto limbs, weird arms. You can't you can't even really call them an arm, right? They're basically proto limbs. They're called, right? They barely could walk on the land, right? Like swivel on it. Um, but they were they, they were able to survive more and more. And the ones who were able to survive more and more on the land, they spread their genes, and they developed features that allowed them to to live longer and longer on land. So they became eventually amphibious, reptiles, right? They grew tails, longer limbs, right? Um, and then eventually the reptiles became more mammalian. Their brains got different, became different, uh, more compacted, more, more connectivity. Um, they stopped laying eggs. They, you know, they developed different ways of produ reproducing and, and, you know, giving offspring. And they became mammals. They lived in the trees. They lived near trees so they ate the tree the foods from the trees the fruits the nuts the seeds things like that the bark 
Eventually, those became monkeys and then apes. They lost their, they, those monkeys left the trees, right? They started walking more across the savannas, typically in Africa or in Asia. And then those apes became more, they walked more upright, right? They, those apes walk more upright, slowly but surely. The ones who can walk more upright for longer, they survive more, right? If you can, if you can walk upright like we do, you can walk very far without having to sweat, right? You barely sweat. You know, anybody can walk a mile or two miles easy. So walking is what we do best as human beings. And that's why we walked upright. And that's what made us human. How come humans are so much smarter than everything else? We're not. We're not that much smarter. <laughs> if you compare a caveman to a, a chimpanzee, right? They're not much different. No, they're, they're not much different. Sure, the caveman will be a little bit smarter, but there's not much of a difference. It's not like so much, such a stark difference. But what makes us so different now is the fact that we live in societies, in civilizations, right? Where we pass down language, we pass down knowledge, right? We wrote down information for the next generations to use so we can develop tools better and faster, right? The wheel, we, we invented fire and then the wheel, and then books. When we invented books, that expedited the process of changes in, 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 in technology. Because now I can use that information as a stepping tool to get to better information, more complex information. Um, do you wish that there's an afterlife? No, I don't know. Um, we invented religion too. Yeah, religion was invented too by people to make them feel comfortable, right? Because when, when you're a human being and you have all this brain power, you know, you start asking questions like, where do we come from? Who made us? Why are we here? Right? These questions that don't have answers to them. They're dumb questions, but we ask them. And eventually we made up stories, little fables like the Bible, like Quran. We, we, we made up these ridiculous stories to make, to make it seem like we know the answers when we don't. What's unicellular life? It's a single-celled organism, a very simple-celled, single-celled organism. That's what unicellular means. Uh, so we went from uh, protocells, basic, basic cells, right? Basic functions to more complex single-celled organisms, and then multicellular organisms, organisms with multiple cells working together, right? Functioning together. And then we had more worm-like animals, insects, and then fish, right? And then the rest came after that. Um, this is impossible to believe. Yeah, it's impossible if you don't understand basic science. But if you do understand science, it's very easy to comprehend. In fact, it makes a lot of sense. And it's backed by tons of evidence. Um, here's an interesting one. The evolution of the eye. This is a very interesting one. The eye isn't all that complex. In fact, the eye is just uh, photoreceptors. They're just cells that can that are stimulated by light, right? Light hits the cell, it activates, right? So once those signals get inputted into an organism, the in organism has a sense of awareness as to where they are because it sees light, right? Now over time, these photoreceptors receptors became together, right? They come together, became more. They 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 uh, what's it called? They chained, they chained together and they formed larger eyes, eyes that have hundreds of photoreceptors, cells, right? Hundreds of cells. Then they became more complex. They developed cups. They got maybe thousands of, proto, uh, of cells into cup form, right? And this allowed them to know direction where the light was coming from, the direction of the light. Then they developed pinholes, more focused light, right? The light can be focused now. That's, it was better resolution for, for the eye. And then it developed a thin layer to protect it from the outside. And then the retina, which allowed us to get even more filtered light into our brains. And that's it. That's, this is how the eye evolved. 
And the eye evolved many different times in many different animals separately, separate instances of eyes, which is remarkable because it means the eye isn't that hard to produce in nature. And all these eyes, including your own, share ancestry with these photoreceptor cells from bacteria. Even bacteria have eyes in the form of these primitive photoreceptor cells. But our eyes are, you know, made of millions of photoreceptors, right? And the structure of them allow them to be as interesting as they are for us. And many other animals like octopus, octopi, have different, even more intricate eyes. Hawks can see from miles away, right? There are a lot of different animals have even more superior eyes than, than us. Um, let me see, what else, what else do you guys want to learn about? So let me get to the earth's, the earth's formation, right? How do the earth form? So how the earth formed is very, very simple. Ooh. All right. So this is called a protoplanetary disk. You see that all that gas and dust, right? All this, all this orange stuff is gas. It's heated plasma, right? It's gas. And this gas is made of things like oxygen, hydrogen, helium, nitrogen, right? Carbon. That's what this gases are made of. And these gases come from stars or they come from, well, typically they come from stars. Sometimes in the early universe, they came from gas clouds in the universe. They were just, it was just gas from the early universe. And we'll talk about the Big Bang right after this one. But this is a gas cloud, right? Now what happens is it collapses due to gravity. Gravity wants to collapse these disks. And because of, because of something called angular momentum, what you have is this swirling, right? The swirling of these disks. And what that does is it is it funnels all that energy and heat to the interior, to the center of it. If you notice, right? All that heat's in the center of it. And what that does is that's the first protostar. So when you have enough heat in the center, it makes a protostar which is the baby star. It's a ba it's an infant star about to ignite. It's not enough heat to ignite and, and, and produce fusion, but it's enough to have a dense amount of plasma there. And the lighter material goes in the outside. So as it swirls around, what happens is you have a star. Eventually, if enough heat, enough materials there, you get a star, a protostar. It starts to ignite. This is the beginning stages of a star. And the gas and dust around it, like we saw before, it gets pushed out by the sun, it, by the star, it produces a shock wave, and all that material, the lighter material, gets sent out um, and it starts to orbit around the disk, around the sun. And th out of this gas and material arises planets and rocks. Right? They become colder, they become colder rocks. They, these rocks in space start to clump together due to gravity, right? And in space, there's something called um, cold, um, cold uh, welding. And essentially, it's because of the properties of space, things in space can clump together much more easily, especially metals. But when it comes to our planet, that's what the Earth is. The Earth is a big rock that clumped together over lots of time and kept being bombarded by all these rocks, right? Look at all these rocks smashing together. That's what I was saying before. This is the beginning of a planet. This is the beginning of a planet right here. You see that? It's just a big clump of rocks and materials that come from the outside, the outskirts of that planetary disk. So after enough time of all that bombardment, you get a planet, a large planet like the Earth. And what happens is it's very hot, right? Because it's been bombarded by all those rocks, a lot of friction heat. And it's so hot that it becomes molten. And on the surface, all you have is really molten rock. Volcanoes, it's very hot rock. It's molten, it's, it's very hot. 
And the, typically the heavier, because of densities, right? The heavier stuff tends to sink and the lighter stuff tends to float, right? So the heavier, because, because the entire earth was molten, even iron, right? Even like the weights you use to weight lift, they're made of iron typically. Well, guess what? That iron in the early earth's history was melted. It was liquidy. It wasn't even solid. It was too hot to be solid. It was liquidy. And because of this, it was able to sink down to the core of the earth. And as it sank down into the core, it formed the, the core and the mantle, which was made of mostly iron and the heavier elements, right? But the lighter stuff was able to float up top, become the crust. It slowly melted and it slowly cooled down into the crust we know today. Um, you have still more bombardment of, of material. Um, and this is the moon. This is, for example, how the moon formed. Um, so early in the Earth's history, the Earth got hit by a big planet called Thea. And Thea knocked a lot of chunk, uh, lot, knocked a lot of stuff off of Earth and it went into space and became the moon. This is amazing, right? This is amazing stuff right here. So all that material went up into the Earth's uh, orbit and became the moon. That's how the moon formed right there about 3.8 3 billion years ago. So the earth is still molten, crust is forming, but it's getting colder, right? So the earth is getting colder and colder, and this is allowing things like an atmosphere to precipitate and water to precipitate and become oceans. Turns out a lot of rocks in space have ice in them, ice water. They're called chondrites, carbonif uh, carboniferous chondrites. They're made of icy water and salt, salt water. And what happens is if when you have enough of these rocks, they bombard the Earth's atmosphere, they become gas gaseous. They go into the atmosphere, their water vapor. And then as the Earth cooled down, it became water. It rained down on the Earth and became the oceans. Um, what is this now? This is, oh, water. Yes, water, the basic building box for life, right? Amino acids. Uh, proteins, lipids, they form in the atmosphere. A lot of the, so a lot of the building blocks for life precipitated from the atmosphere. A lot of the gases like methane and ammonia, right? These gases, when configured in certain ways with energy, lightning, right? Sun, UV radiation, they can produce amino acids. The building blocks of life, the building blocks of life are made in the Earth's atmosphere and in space. So in the oceans, right? Because we have oceans now, we also have these organic molecules mixing together in the oceans and life, it begins to emerge about three and a half, four billion years ago. Now you have an atmosphere, now you have oceans and life, um, but so a lot of volcanic activity, a lot of, a lot of gases being emitted from the volcanoes. And now you have plate tectonics. You have shifting of plates. The crust was cool enough to become plates. And because they were, they sit upon mantle, the mantle, which is molten, it's able, they're able to move upon the surface and collide with each other and form mountains or ridges or, or volcanoes or earthquakes, things like that. That's what plate tectonics is all about. Um, remember, there is no oxygen yet. There was no oxygen in the atmosphere yet. So these blue planets are not quite correct yet. The blue colors don't come until cyanobacteria, which emit oxygen in the atmosphere, right? So a lot of that oxygen is being emitted by bacteria, and that's what gave us the oxygen that we breathe today. A lot of that, a lot of that oxygen that we, you're breathing today comes from bacteria. Bacteria gas, they farted, <laughs> right? And a lot of that stuff we're breathing right now, that's coming from those cyanobacteria that lived billions of years ago. That's amazing. Um, okay, so now we have oceans, plate tectonics. The surface of the earth has changed, has changed many times. 
And with this caused changes in the Earth's climate, right? The Earth became a snowball at one point. The Earth was covered in snow at one point. Because of the way platonic, plate tectonics plays a role in climate, it can affect life. It can affect the climate. So there's a lot of things that affected the Earth. Um, here are some corals. Sea life. Sea life is the most biodiverse. There are so many different types of sea life. This is a trilobite. This is a, one of the first living things that we know of that we have fossils for in the oceans. The earliest things, they're called trilobites. We actually have, I've actually held some in my hand. They're amazing, amazing creatures. Um, but they resemble kind of like crabs, right? They resemble kind of like insects. And that's where the insects come from. All the insects of today, the ants, the bees, the wasps, right? All these insects, they come from those sea creatures billions of years ago. Those are their ancestors. Um, now, where are we now? Let's see. Oh, there's a fish. About uh, 700 million years ago, the, the first fish emerged. The first fish, um, the first shellfish. Oh, now we got Tiktaalik. This is Tiktaalik. This is some of the first land creatures. They're some of the first land creatures. They're able to make it on land. Um, and the first trees. The first trees emerged about 300 million years ago. Trees didn't exist until uh, after fish. And that's what allowed, that's really what allowed us to be on land. The trees give us oxygen. They give us places to, you know, stay, protection from the weather, right? Uh, there is food nearby, food sources, right? Trees allowed us to go onto land. And those trees can be traced back to the cyanobacteria. That's even, that's even more remarkable, right? That those trees, right, plant life can be traced back to the life from the oceans, the cyanobacteria from the oceans. So again, all life is connected. There's a chain. All living things are connected in some way. So now we have trees and here's Tiktaalik getting onto land. As you can see, it's not easy for them, right? Because they don't have arms or legs yet. They didn't have arms or legs. They didn't just right, come out the ocean with arms or legs. They had proto limbs, which were enabled them to barely get on land, but eventually that's when they became more complex as they as they evolved furthermore. And here is the dinosaurs about uh, 200, 200 million years ago. About uh, 250 million years ago, the first dinosaurs appeared, right? These are from the reptiles. Dinosaurs came from the reptiles. And we all know what happened about 70 million years ago was the, the rock, the asteroid that, that smashed into the earth, right? And unfortunately, the dinosaurs died. The larger ones died, but the smaller ones survived. The smaller dinosaurs became birds. Here's a T-Rex. This is one of the most accurate depictions of what a T-Rex looked like. Um, dinosaurs lived almost everywhere on the earth, even Antarctica. Dinosaurs lived on Antarctica. They lived in Asia, North America, Africa. Um, they even lived in South America and even the Arctic and even Europe. Every, almost every continent was full of dinosaurs. And over time, the plate tectonics change even more. Um, uh, these are some of the first um, birds. Oh, and here we go. Here's the asteroid 70 million years ago. It hit the Yucatan Peninsula near Mexico. And what happened was all that energy and heat and all that debris went into the atmosphere. It was such an impact that it covered the entire earth in dust. The entire earth was covered in dust. And what this did was it stopped the sunlight from reaching the Earth's surface. And this killed off plant life, right? 75% of land life died. They went extinct. And the food chain suffered greatly because of this. The sun is important for life. And when you stop it, when you block it, you kill life. Only the smaller animals survived. The smaller ones who were smart enough to live underground and find food to hibernate enough Right? They get enough fat to survive the cold. 
So the earth became cold because of the lack of sun, the lack of heat. It was also a very toxic environment to live in. So only the strongest survived. Only the strongest survived. And who were those? The mammals. The mammals. That's our ancestor right there. That is, the, that is our ancestor that survived the dinosaur impact. There it is. They lived in trees, right? They lived underground. They were adaptable. They were very smart when it comes to surviving. And eventually they branched out into monkeys and then apes. And here's the first ape called Proconsul. He walked on fours. Here's the first Archipithecus sufferensis, the first humans. What happened? Okay, sorry guys. Did you see what I said? Okay. Here's the first uh, uh here's the first humans, right? The first humans lived like this in the savannas of Africa. Uh uh North Africa as well. And they were able to walk upright and they were able to walk around. They migrated across the uh, across the continent. And this the the ability for them to walk across the continent. So when you ask when people ask why are we so smart, right? Why are we so smart? It's because we were able to adapt to the different environments that we migrated to, right? Because when you walk across the continent, you have to find new shelter, new homes, new food sources, new water sources. So as we left the trees, we became more uh, smarter. We had to find new habitats. Here's Homo habilis, one of the first humans that we can call our ancestors in terms of like they're almost like us, almost identical to us, Homo habilis. These guys were the first ones to develop fire about a million, 1.5 million years ago. Um, so now that they have fire, they're able to find food better, stone tools, right? And now we have Homo erectus, Neanderthals. They lived. They we, they migrated up to Africa to uh, Europe and Asia, right? So they, they left Africa to Europe and Asia. They became better foragers and hunters. Uh, there's Neanderthals. They 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 fought off mammoths, right? Like our ancestors were nuts. They were wild. They were perhaps even smarter than us or stronger than us in some ways. But they were able to fight off a lot of animals and survive that way in the cold, right? Because now we're... When we left Africa, we had to adapt to the cold weather, right, of Europe and Asia. It was cold. It was during the Ice Age as well. And because of this, we had to fight off a lot of that cold. We had to wear clothing. We had to, we had to use our fire ability. We had to use um, our brains to um, adapt to the changing climate. There's some of our ancestors. And then about 10,000 years ago, agriculture emerged. Agriculture, the first time we developed farming. And this changed us forever. This made us, this is what makes us human today, Homo sapiens. Farming, agriculture, civilization, societies, right? So now we're able to grow our own food wherever we want, and we can settle there and stay there. Now we can stay in a place and call it our home forever. And from that, we develop technology. So we're able to we're able to we're able to use our brains more and, and learn more and think more about things, right? We're able to develop steam engines things like this and, and develop, uh, you know, the first map of the world, right? The first boats, the first books, the first engines, the basic en steam engines. And this allowed us to become human today. The first cities, first factories, the industrial revolution begins, cars, trucks, right? This expedited the process of our changing, right? Now we, now we inhabit the entire planet as homo sapiens. And that's us, right? That's our story, which is quite, quite remarkable, quite remarkable. And now we have, now we're damaging our planet now, and right? now we're making it worse, flooding and fires. 
right? So that's our story. All right, let's talk about the Big Bang now, you guys. Well, let, let's just hold on for a second. Uh, I answer some questions here. Where is Adam and Eve? They don't exist. There's no way. Good job, Mike. Thank you. Yeah, unfortunately, the ones who need to hear this are not here. They're just saying, oh, it's dumb. It's dumb. Um, we're going to talk about the Big Bang right after this. Um, what is that video called? I don't know, actually. I just... I just typed in, uh, it was just for visuals. Our ancestors ate meat. Okay, they also ate plants. What's your point? <laughs> How do you know they don't exist? Because evolution debunks the first, there was no first person, right? There can't be a first person. I have plenty of videos on that. You can go check my channel for that. They plugged their ears and looked the other way, yeah. So that's our story, right? It's amazing. What an amazing thing to understand our story of how we got here. Billions of years and now we are here today. That's amazing. All the thing of all of our ancestors, all the people that lived before us, the billions of people before us, all their thoughts, all their feelings, all of their ideas they had, right? That's amazing. All the reptiles, all the fish that preceded us, all the living things before us, the dinosaurs. That's amazing to understand. That's amazing stuff. It's amazing stuff. Um, okay, the Big Bang. I just let that digest for a second, right? Because it's a lot of information. Thank you for the galaxy. How did the dinosaurs get so big? Yeah, good question. The reason why is mainly because they had no competition. The dinosaurs were the top of the food chain. They, they had no competition. So they were able to survive and be as big as they could. Uh, and also, they were also motivated to be bigger because of there, there were a lot of carnivores, right? Now, there were no other competitors outside of the dinosaurs, but within the dinosaurs, there were lots of competitors, right? Lots of carnivores trying to eat each other. But if you were big... You wouldn't be eaten by a carnivore. If you're too big, you're you're gonna be you're gonna be protected against any carnivore trying to eat you. You're just too big, right? It's like you trying to beat up King Kong. It's not gonna happen. So, when it comes to the time of that, you know, 250 million years ago, there was a reason why animals were big to protect protect themselves against predators. Also, dinosaurs that can eat leaves from the tall trees. Trees were tall. A lot of, there was a lot more CO2 in the atmosphere, a lot more oxygen, and this allowed them, this allowed trees to become bigger and even animals to become bigger. More metabolism, right? More energy there for them to be bigger. Um, dinosaurs also had very hollow bones, which allowed them to be very large in size. Their bones were not as dense as ours. They're much more hollow. This allowed them to be kind of like lighter in terms of their structure, but bigger in terms of size. So yeah, that's how that worked. Thank you for the galaxy, by the way. Um, okay, the Big Bang. Any, who has questions about the Big Bang? There was more oxygen. Yes, that's one of the reasons why. Would their bones be more fragile? Yes. Yes, but they were big. They didn't move much. <laughs> they didn't move much, right? What is the Big Bang? Okay, great. The Big Bang. Humans have no competition, but there's no reason for us to be big. There's no there's no motivation for us to be that big, right? We're not being eaten by by elephants or anything, right? There's no reason for us to be bigger. Um, and by the way, our brains require lots of energy. So being big in size might require more energy in that way too. So it would take away energy from our brain power. Um, how could nothing come from something? That's not what we said. Okay, so the, the Big Bang is not something from nothing. So get that out of your head, right? The Big Bang does not mean that there is nothing and then suddenly something happened. That's not the Big Bang, okay? So get that out of your head. The Big Bang is simply the expansion 
of a pre-existing space and time. Space and time could have always existed, but then expanded and stretched, stretched out into a larger universe, right? So think of it that way. Think of it that way. It was not something from nothing. It was that something was always there, perhaps, and that it expanded. So in the early universe, this is just a picture. This isn't how this isn't really what it looked like. But remember, the Big Bang was happened everywhere. The Big Bang happened where you're standing, right? It happened everywhere in the universe. The entire universe was way more smaller and compacted and very hot. Imagine compressing all the imagine when you know when you compress a when you compress something it gets hotter, right? When you compress like a like a ball or something, it gets hotter. Well, that's how the universe was, right? When you compress all that stuff, it was way hotter back then. So the early universe was a very hot, dense state where it was everywhere. Even where you're standing was that place. But there was some kind of energy, it's called dark energy, that, that motivated the universe to, 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 to rip, rip apart and uh, expand and stretch. And that's what happened here, right? There was the initial hot state, it expanded, and that allowed the stuff in, in the universe, that hot stuff, that matter, right? Because all that matter was hot. It was, a, it was a gluon quark plasma, they call it. Very high energy stuff, very high energy matter. And that's where you come from, that high energy matter that cooled down. Where did the matter come from? It was always there, perhaps. We don't know where it came from. But it could have always existed in some way, right? So as the universe expanded, the universe got colder. And this allowed that gluon plasma to become matter like we know today. Baryonic matter, dark matter. And it became stars, right? That gas infiltrated the entire universe and it became stars. It became planets, galaxies, right? And this is what made our universe today. So you can see space and time expands as time goes on. And this is this is how the, the expansion looks like, right? This is how it really looks. Think of it, think of it like this. All the space is expanding away from each other. Every point of it is expanding away. Every point. And the further away you are from something, the faster it's expanding outwards. The faster it's expanding. So think of it that way. We look back at the James Webb telescope and saw fully formed planets. Get a new theory. No, that's not what we saw. We didn't see fully formed planets. We saw where galaxies that we know were um very old. It's about 13 billion years old, but they weren't, there's nothing stopping the Big Bang from being true. There's nothing that debunks the Big Bang. So that's how it looks. This is the history of the universe. This is 13.7 billion years of history where you have that CB radiation. And that's what we see when we look at telescopes. And then that's what we see when we see galaxies and things like this. That's the Big Bang. So it doesn't mean that the universe started from nowhere. It doesn't mean God did it. It doesn't mean that there's a magic thing doing it. It's just matter and energy expanding and space and time expanding. That's it. Ugh. And we have nobody watching. <laughs> they all left. All the, all the Christians left. So... I mean, this is amazing stuff. This is amazing. This amazes me. Maybe you guys are bored, but I don't know. I like science. I like learning. Um, that's why I'm here I'm trying to make you guys learn. Is space and time still expanding? Yes, it's still expanding. Yeah, the universe is still expanding today. And eventually the universe will continue to expand. We think it will continue to expand. And eventually the universe will get so large and so big that 
nothing will happen anymore in the universe because everything will be so far apart from each other that nothing can ever happen again. It's called, this is called the heat death of the universe. Stuff is so spread apart that no more motion happens. It's a cold, dark universe forever. But we don't know, we don't know exactly what's going to happen, but that's an idea that we have. Of course, all the Christians are gone. All the theists are out. Boring. I don't understand this. I gotta go. <laughs> nope. Evolution's a fact. Evolution's a fact. We can see evolution. Evolution is not a theory. It's a fact. There is no prime mover. That doesn't make any sense in physics. That doesn't... Aristotle doesn't make this. Aristotle doesn't have a physics experience anymore. He's it's an old way of thinking. Nope, evolution's a fact. We can observe evolution. It really happens. I don't know why it's so. I don't know why this is so hard for people to grasp. It's a fact. Get over it. Get over it. It happens. Why is the Big Bang still a theory? Well, the Big Bang is still a theory because it's it's what explains. The fact that the universe is expanding, right? That's what explains it. Theories are mechanisms. They're explanations for facts, right? A theory isn't just a statement. It's an explanation that is based in facts and data, right? So there are facts within theories. Facts are contained within theories, not the other way around. Why is evolution a theory? Guys, evolution is not a theory. Natural selection is a theory. But again, when you when we say when you when we say something is a theory in science, we don't mean that it's just a, a random idea. No. In science, a theory is a very good idea that is based on tons of data. It's explanatory. It explains the fact Theories are the top. Like it's, it's, in fact, theories are better than facts. Theories are better than facts because theories explain the facts. There's, that's what explains the fact, right? So when you say it's just a theory, that doesn't do anything. That doesn't, it's not the, it's not the critique you think it is. You're not doing anything. You're not damaging science by saying it's a theory. Theories are taken very seriously in science. Just because you don't understand what it is doesn't mean it's false. No, evolution is a fact. We can observe evolution. It really happens. Evolution happens. Natural selection also happens. We can observe natural selection. Science is just estimates. No, science is based on tons of evidence and data. They're not just estimates. They're, they're observations. They're experiments. That's the science. What you got is not even a theory. You don't even have a theory. You have a book of fairy tales. No, science is not just a guessing game. Science is based on observation. We can observe. We can experiment. It's not just a, a guess. It's something we observe and see and measure. Well, nobody's watching, so it's like everybody left. So People just want to see debates. They don't want to learn. I don't know. It excited me. I guess it didn't. It, it just, I guess nobody else is excited about learning, but I don't know.
Yeah, everybody's watching NFL. I'm sad. Well, I'm sad that people don't... <laughs> people want debates, 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 but they don't know what they're debating about. You know? That's what I'm sad about. They don't know what they're debating about. Attention span, yeah. Our attention spans are like two seconds now. Did say by Genesis need a lot of energy to happen? Yeah, it does. That's why we don't see it happening anymore. <laughs> It requires a lot of energy and certain amounts of conditions, certain types of conditions that no longer exist. So if all life died today, it is highly unlikely that it will ever come about again on Earth. It'll be just there'll be it'll be too cold and it'll be too uh the conditions will not be right to make it as we know it. Explain black holes. Um, well, nobody knows what black holes are, right? But essentially, black holes are not really objects. They're um, a black hole is literally a it's literally a part of space and time itself that is so warped it is so so much mass in that one area that that space and time in that area is so stretched so much that even light can't escape it's so much mass there's so much gravity there it's so dense that light cannot escape all right and things get sucked into them so when you think of a black hole think of space and time itself what it does to space and time itself. It's warping it, right? Because space and time can warp like a fabric. Think of it like a sheet, right? It can warp to running it if there's mass, if, if mass is there, right? Mass can, can impact space time. We impact space time. You are warping space right now by a little bit, but a black hole does a lot. And that's why nothing can escape because it's like, you need you need to be you need, to be, you need a lot of velocity to leave the gravity of a black hole. Black holes do evaporate eventually. Yeah, they do. Black holes actually, on the quantum level, they actually emit energy, um, called virtual particles or Hawking radiation. And over time, it's a really crazy phenomenon. But yeah, this is dumb, right? No, nobody cares. No, no, nobody. Nobody cares. I just want to watch, I want to watch, uh, what's the entertainment, uh, uh, I don't, I'm not laughing, uh, my attention span is three seconds. <laughs> but yeah, anyway, um, black holes are fascinating because around the black hole is this superheated gas that rotates around it called the accretion disk. And uh, a lot of the, the stuff is superheated so much that it actually gives off its own light. So you can see black holes by looking at the stuff around it, right? So this is an actual picture of a black hole. This is a real picture of a black hole. And we can only see it because of the stuff around it, the superheated gas around it. Um, but the reason why there's a hole in the middle is because that's, it's not an object. That black stuff is not an object. It's space and time itself that is so warped that, you know, nothing can escape that. But we don't know what's inside of the black hole. There could be some kind of thing inside the black hole. We just don't know what it is. Or maybe there's nothing there. Maybe on the other side of black hole is another 
dimension for another universe or another part of the universe. Um, one of the biggest mysteries of science is what is inside of black hole. It's still a grand mystery. Amazing because Einstein predicted black holes a hundred years ago with with relativity. He thought he knew they would exist at. But he didn't. He didn't think they would exist because he was like, "This doesn't make any sense. What is this? Like, why would that exist?" It did. He couldn't. Th he couldn't. He couldn't visualize the black hole. What it. What. It, what it really. What it was. Now, we're getting more insight with quantum mechanics. And it's making more sense. Now it seems like entanglement has to do with black holes, or wormholes. Something quantum mechanical about them. Um, very freaky stuff. Quantum mechanics is very crazy. But we still don't know what happens. We still don't know what they are. Yeah. Do you think we'll ever find a way to see what's in a black hole? Well, maybe if... You, uh, Stephen Hawking said that if he died... Stephen Hawking wanted to be, his wish was to be sent to a black hole to see what happens, right? If like he was terminally ill, he would be sent to a black hole to see what happens inside of it. But we'll never, probably we'll never know unless we have some kind of new unified theory of uh, maybe string theory. Maybe something like that can give us more insight, but we don't know. Please explain pulsars. Um, yeah, pulsars are just super dense um, stars that typically are the remnants of supernovae. Um, typically, when a star explodes, when a super massive star, right? That's something we should explain. I could explain too. But when a big giant star goes supernova. It leaves a lot of its gas out there in space, but what is the remnants of that supernova explosion is typically a neutron star or a pulsar. So basically, they're dead stars, but they they are still made of material that they're. I mean, they're made of neutrons. They're so dense that they're made of neutrons. They're so tightly connected together. They're called, they're 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 made by they're made of neutrons, made of neutrons. Um. But what happens is because there's so much um, current, right? There's so much electricity. There's so much magnetism in a pulsar because of the, the amount of movement, motion inside of it. The spinning of the star, right? Pulsars spin at thousands of times per second. They're, they're spinning super fast. They're rotating super fast. And this motion produces a current, produces electricity, magnetism. And because of this, it emits bursts of energy called pulsars um, that can go out into space in, in both directions. And they're kind of like a lighthouse, right? They're like the lighthouses of the, of the universe in which they, they're spinning so fast, but the light shines. If you're looking at it, the light would shine in your face um, just for a second, right? But like a flickering. So we can see around the universe these flickering objects, which are pulsars, because they're producing this light um, in the form of like really X, uh, these are X rays, gamma rays, right? Very super high energy wave uh, waves, um, and that's what a neutron. That's what a pulsar is essentially. Of course, there's much more to it, but the point is that that's what it is. It's an amazing phenomena. I love neutron stars; they're amazing. amazing and 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 yeah like like i said they're they're the remnants of the core of us of a giant star everything so far has a natural explanation yeah <laughs> yeah it is when we look at them we are seeing them in the way of the past well everything is yeah because light takes time to travel everything you see 
you're seeing in the past. When I look at, for example, light travels at uh, 600 million miles per hour. I think it's 180,000 kilometers per second. Per second. 180,000 kilometers a second, right? That's a fast thing. So, but it's not instantaneous. It's not instantaneous. So when, when you, you know, when you, when you open the lights in your room, well, guess what? It seems instantaneous because you're right next to the light bulb, right? You're right next to it. It seems instantaneous, especially to your brain. But if enough distance is there, right? If you're looking at a star, maybe a light year away or five, 10 light years away. That means it took 10 years, 10 earth years for that light to reach your eye, right? So because light takes time to travel, it took 10 years for that light to get to your eye from the star 10 light years away. So what that means is when you look at stars, most stars in, in, that you see in the night sky are the stars that you're seeing that were from the past or 10, 20, 50, even a thousand years in the, in the past some millions of years in the past. So, yeah. A lot of the stars you see aren't there anymore. Yeah. In fact, Betelgeuse might have... Betelgeuse is a supermassive star that most likely already went supernova. And we can see it in the night sky and we're waiting for it to go supernova and it could go supernova in our lifetime. It could happen within the next 10, 20, 50, 100 years. In the case, we'll actually see a supernova in the sky for maybe a few months. We'll see it glowing in the sky, almost like as much as brightness as the moon on the full moon. It'll be very interesting to see. Um, in fact, that's probably what a lot of people saw in the past. A lot of supernovas have happened in the past, and probably that's what a lot of religions reference as like gods or angels um but yeah it's very interesting explain how lightning happens <laughs> Light, lightning happens when you have so in the air in the atmosphere there are clouds right these clouds are full of water water vapor but a lot of the clouds also contain salts and all kinds of grains, dust, all kinds of stuff it picks up from the air, from the ground. So they can get lifted up into the clouds and mix in with the cloud, right? So now, now when you have a mixing of dust in a cloud, now you have static electricity, right? Now you're building up static because those grains of sand and dust and, and stuff they're charged right they're charged so now you have these clouds are, that have electrical charge when they pass over areas of the earth where there's a opposite charge on the ground well what happens now is that static electricity from the cloud is now going to attract to be attracted to the to the, uh, the ch opposite charge on the ground and this is what causes the static electricity it's called lightning right? That spark is lightning, just like static electricity, just like when you rub your feet on the carpet and you hit the light, you hit the light, uh, outlet, right? You can feel that static shock. That's lightning. It's just on a bigger scale when it comes to the earth. Um, and some clouds can have lots of charge and lightning happens all the time. Lightning, lightning happens every second somewhere on the earth. It's a very common occurrence. Are they charged because of friction? Friction, but also that stuff in, in the clouds. Mike, your Boltzmann brain? What's that? How do you know how do you know that? <laughs> I know what it is, but how do you how do you know that? Does space have cracks? Yeah, it does. It could have cracks. Um So in the early universe. In the earth, at the Big Bang, all the forces of nature that we know today, gravity, weak force, 
strong force, right? The atomic forces. All the forces of nature were combined into one super force. There were so it was such a high density and hot area, hot time in the universe, hot state that all the forces of nature were combined into one. But as the universe expanded, those forces of nature quickly changed phases. And in the process, we think that we think that space and time itself was affected in a way that it would crack. It would it kind of like when you have an ice cube, right? When you have an ice cube that that freezes, you see cracks in it because there's there's a it's not a perfect it's not a perfect structure, right? There's differences in the structure. So when space time expanded, the phase change happened, and this caused a crack, kind of like like an ice cube cracking. Um, and they're called super strings. And these are hypothetical, but if they exist, that would give more credence to string theory. Um, yeah, so, I don't know. That's unfortunate that nobody cares. But I won't give up. Yeah, it is fascinating, but it's fortunate that people don't understand. People don't understand. Especially theists, especially believers. They don't understand the beauty of science. They just don't get it. How amazing it is. How amazing evolution is. How amazing the Big Bang is. How amazing... The Earth's formation is. How amazing science is. Carl Sagan is the goat. Yeah, he is the goat. I wish he was still here. I just want to explore the universe. Me too. Let me find a video of like the size of the universe. Like I think you guys liked the last time. So here's a person. Now we're going out. Oh, they're in they're in California. Ten thousand kilometers the planet Earth. Now it's just a dot. That's home. <laughs> asteroids. We're surrounded by many asteroids, by the way. It's Mars, the Sun, Jupiter, Saturn. It's inverted. Yeah, I know. Now, the Sun is just another star. This is a trillion kilometers. The outer Oort cloud. So, the Oort cloud surrounds the Sun. And the sun also has, just like the earth has a magnetic, magnetic sphere, the, the sun does. The sun has a um, very large, it's called a heliosphere that, that encapsulates everything within it and protects us from interstellar gas. Stars, nebulas. Oh, beautiful galaxy. I love our galaxy. But we're like over here, you know, we're like on the outskirts of the galaxy. And the center of our galaxy is a giant, uh, supermassive black hole, if you guys didn't know. Um, 
And the reason why there's so much light there is because there's so many stars, so con so dense full of stars, and they're orbiting around the black hole very quickly. Some some are orbiting at, at a million miles an hour around this the black hole, but the but the arms of the galaxy are um, moving quite fast as well. Yeah, it's clustered, yeah. And the Milky Way also has moons. The Milky Way has some moon galaxies, too. Quite a few, actually. I think three or four. And here's our galactic neighborhood. Andromeda, Ursa Major Group. We got clusters of galaxies now, right? <laughs> this is a real... This is the cosmic web. Look at this. This is real scale. Like, like each one of these dots are galaxies. Like, that's incredible. That's amazing. Each one of those dots are galaxies and there's clusters of galaxies. And there, and there's an entire web full of galaxies. Like this is incredible. The size, the sheer scale of the universe is amazing. Amazing. Oh, now we're going inside. Now let's get to smaller scales. Here's the retina. Blood cells, right? You got cells in your blood vessels moving around, right? Ex giving oxygen to your body. Chromosomes, DNA. Here's DNA. Right there. They're each full of millions of molecules, polymers and molecules, right? Atoms. Each one of those molecules made of atoms. Electrons. Right? All the different electrons, different spins. Emptiness, atomic emptiness. The nucleus. Protons and neutrons. Quarks. And that's it. That's as far it's this as far as sm it's the smallest we can see. <laughs> but that's amazing. There's an entire people think that there's a there's a universe big out you know, that's out there, but even inside of us is a universe. Inside of every one of you is is an entire universe. Another universe. That you don't see. Right? There, there's an entire world inside of you that you don't see. Just like there is on the outside. There's so much we don't see and don't understand. There's, 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 a, you know, it's amazing. Um, here's a scale, here's a scale of, uh, planets, here's some dwarf planets. This is why Pluto is no longer considered a major planet, because it's the size of these small thing, these small little rocks, right? Pluto's only 2,000 kilometers. That's like the size of, like, um, like, California. Like, it's tiny. Here's Europa, Moon of Jupiter, and our moon. Our moon is actually not that large. Compared to other moons of Saturn, like Titan. Titan is way bigger than our moon. Even Mercury. Titan's bigger than Mercury. Titan's almost as big as Mars. Like, that's crazy. Venus and the Earth are twin. Here's Kepler 22b. This is an exoplanet that's an Earth-like planet, but just a giant, a giant, even bigger rock than Earth. Saturn. I love Saturn. Jupiter. Jupiter's a big boy, but the Sun is a bigger boy. <laughs> look, look at how big the Sun is compared to the Earth. Right, the Earth is all the way down here. You can't even see it. This is a real scale. Like this is a I, like I can tell this is a really good scale. Um but look how much look at look at how much stuff the sun is made of. Look at how much gas and dust it is compared to the earth. It's like a piece of dust. It's like nothing. Um but the sun isn't even a big star. Look, we got Sirius. This is a Sirius star. Here's a giant star. And it's Sirius you can see in the night sky. This one too. These are red giants. So 
when we get to the red giants, these are likely ones that are about to go supernova, right? These are giant stars that likely inflated um, because they're dying. When a star dies, they inflate because they lose, um, you know, pressure going outwards from sun. So now they're able to become larger. I'm sorry, they gain pressure from the from from fusion. Um, Octorus as well is a giant star. Here's the black hole in the center of our of our galaxy. It's the size of a star, but it has the mass of millions of stars. Here's a super giant star. And they get even bigger. <laughs> this is called a hyper giant star. I mean, this is insane. Even bigger. They get even bigger. Canis Majoris. A hyper giant. Two billion kilometers. That's like the size of our entire solar system. No, that's like bigger. That's like that's like 10 times the size of our solar system. The biggest star is about 3 billion kilometers. That's crazy. And here's the black hole that we think is the biggest in the universe. Super massive. That's crazy. That is crazy stuff. It's almost scary. Nebulas. I love nebulas. Now, you can tell in the center here, there's a little dot. And that's a star that died. So typically, in um, typically what this nebula is, right? If you wonder what this is, what is this? Why does it look like an eye? Well, it's not really an eye. It's gas. It's because that star in the center, it was like our sun. When our sun dies, it'll look like this. Almost like this. Because our sun's not big enough to go supernova and explode. It's not going to explode. But it, it is big enough to um, have a lot of that dust and gas eventually uh, stripped away from the sun. And then it'll collapse into a white dwarf. And that's what it is here in the center. right? So what you're seeing in the center here is the white dwarf that collapsed from a star. And all that gas from it went out into space. In rings, right? So it went slowly in all directions like a ring. And that's what a nebula is. And here's Head Horse Nebula, seven light years across. This is where stars are born. Here's galaxies. And you got all kinds of stars and galaxies, uh, sizes of galaxies. Two, 200 light years across. That's a tiny one. Most galaxies are around 100,000 light years across, like ours. Milky Way. I love the Milky Way. Such a great galaxy to be in. Andromeda is a big boy. 200,000 light years across. Here's a hyper galaxy. So you, you got all kinds of objects in the universe scaling out. It's quite amazing. And there's our entire universe. That's the scale of the entire universe. We don't know what, is, what we don't know what else is out there, right? We don't know how big the universe is. We'll never know, unfortunately, how big it is. Because at some point, space gets too far and too fast. Space expands too fast for us to see. Because light. You know, if there's anything else on the other side of that expansion, if it's light, it can't go fast enough to reach us. Because at some point, space in time itself is stretching faster than space. Uh, faster than light. I'm sorry. Space and time expands faster than light in some regions of the universe. This is called the event horizon. So... We know this exists, and that and that's why 
we will never be able to see what else is out there. No matter how hard we try, we'll never be able to see the full scale of the universe. Unless there's something deeper about and something that there's other some kind of physics that allows us to do so. But but we're cut off from a lot of it. In fact, scientists think that the universe is about 500 times larger than what we observe. And that's the least, like, like some scientists think it could be thousands, millions of times bigger than what we think. So in the observable universe, there are 10 to the 24 stars. That's 10 to the 24. 10 with 24 zeros. The, that is more stars than grains of sand on every beach of the earth. Right? Think of a handful of sand. That's 10,000 grains in a handful. 10,000 grains in a handful. Think of how many handfuls in a, in, a, in a beach. Millions, billions. That's how many stars there are in the universe on all, all of the beaches of the earth. So that's a lot of stars. But guess what? There could be millions of times more than that. There could be 10 to the 28 stars, 10 to the 30 stars. Because that's how many stars that it could be beyond our horizon, beyond the horizon. So at this point, the universe is basically almost infinite. At that, at that scale, the universe is just too, inf too large for us to grasp. We can't grasp it. So when a theist tells me that, that everything was made for me, that's why I have doubts. <laughs> when a theist says that everything in the universe was tuned so that I can be watched in bed by a magic wizard, that's why I have doubts. Because of things like science, the scientific perspective that allows us to see the true scale of the world, it defies what we typically think. It defies what we typically think. In fact, most of the, m most of the time, most of the time, what is true about the universe is not intuitive to us. Most of the time. It's never. Think of how intuitive God is. Oh yeah, he loves me. He cares for me. He made me from clay. That's intuitive. But typically, things that are not intuitive are true. It's almost never the case that things that are intuitive are true. Flat earth. Intuitive, not true. The sun revolving around the earth. Intuitive, but not true. How did the first life get here? Um, protocell. So we know that. Let me let me try to let me get this picture for you. Fish with legs. <laughs> so here's a protocell. This is how the first cell formed. These are called lip lipid bilayers. Now, each one of these strands is, is a lipid molecule. But because of the... But these lipids can actually form chains, right? Chains of lipids. Um, but what happens is, on some of these lipids, there is an end that is hydrophobic. It doesn't like water right? It opposes water. It's not attracted to water. But the other side of that lipid molecule is polarized to being hydrophonic, which is attracted to water. So what happens is because of the different polarities of that molecule on the ends of the molecule, when you have chains of these lipids, right, you it forms a layer that if you watch, it can become spherical. Right. So they form, they collect together, 
These are the chains of lipids I was talking about, right? They form a longer chain, a longer and longer chain. And now look, now look what happens. Now, when they exist in water, what tends to happen is they want to co uh, become together. And because of the polarities of the molecules, they form a spherical structure, right? Because the molecules on the inside are keeping the water out. The waters on the outside are keeping the water. Uh, the molecules on the inside are keeping the water in. The molecules on the outside are keeping the water out. And it forms that spherical structure, which is the first cell. I mean, this is very basic. This is the basics, basics of it. But actually, I want to show you guys. This is amazing to look at, actually. I mean, let me show you um, how DNA works. Like a DNA, DNA animation. Really amazing. So here's a human cell, right? You got the nucleus. By the way, I'm not an expert in microbiology, but here's the basics of it. I'm just going to show you the basics. Um, so these are strands of DNA. Uh, these are chromosomes. And these, this is how genes are transcribed in your body, in your cells. So what this is, is basically the replication Nucleus gateway. Is this a, is there a 4K version of this? No. Hey, we got more. We got more people in here. Everybody, keep tapping. Keep keep liking. Um, so here's a new, the human cell. Uh, each of your 10 trillion cells has 1.8 meters of DNA. Did you guys hear that? Every one of your cells has a meter or two meters long of DNA. DNA is made of billions of molecules. I mean, billions of atoms. And when there's amount, when there's, when you have enough of these atoms, right? Like in the pattern like this, you get a strain of DNA. That's all DNA is. All DNA is, is a long pattern of molecules in certain patterns because of the properties of them. Every molecule has a certain property, and when they are aligned in certain ways, they develop a strand like this. That's very orderly, called DNA. And um, what is this now? This is how your cells organize their DNA. I'm sorry, guys. I'm not a biologist. I don't know all the terms here, but. Uh, let me see. A dividing cell. Oh, here's the here's the vision. So here's a cell on, in a microscope. And what do you guys see it? You guys see the cell splitting? This is mitosis happening right in front of you. Now it's two cells, right? Let me do that again. This is so crazy. This is a literal cell on a, in, a tel, in a microscope, splitting. See, the, these are the chromosomes in the cells. And you can see now there are two different cells. That's how your cells multiply every day. Every, every day, millions of cells are produced in your body that way. And I don't know what this is. Billions of these micro machines are copying your DNA, right? So now you have an even more complex process in your cells, making genes and making all these things that make up your DNA. Again, it's a very lengthy process, complex process, but it's complex because of the molecules that are complex. This is, they're saying it's real time speed. I wonder if it's true. DNA copy mechanism. This is really crazy. You guys keep saying God's amazing, but you're not realizing that this same process gives us cancer. <laughs> like, like the reason why DNA is this way is because it, you know, there's a, there's a, a me uh, chemical process that does this. It's not, it's not a God. Just because it's too complex for you to comprehend doesn't mean God had to do it. There doesn't have to be somebody doing it, right? 
Um, but this is incredible. I just want to show you guys this. Um, and you know, you can see here the nu the four nucleotides that your DNA is made of. That's what produces your DNA. Base pairs, they're called. Um, you know, and your genome contains three billion base pairs. So that's what gives you your genes. That's what makes up wh who you are. That's what makes you who you are. Um, so for example, the reason why you are the way you are now is because your DNA has those specific structures of nucleobases, right? And they tell your cells how to divide and multiply like we just saw, right? So the way your, your DNA is, it tells your cells how to duplicate and multiply and which ones to multiply. It tells your body, it tells your cells which ones to make. Um, and it's not like it's telling it. There's no consciousness there. It's just that it's the chemical process, right? Um, and that's what makes you who you are, right? Your cells give rise to other cells that make up your body. They make, those cells make up tissue and organs, your heart, your lungs, right? You have brain cells, you have lung cells, heart cells. And your DNA contains information that has all of your cells in it. Your DNA contains all the information that produces each one of your organ cells, the cells in your organs, your brain, your heart, your lung, your skin. Again, it's a very complex thing to understand at first, but once you get it, you realize that it's just a natural process. It's, it's an amazing thing, but it's a natural process. We, a lot of people suffer this Dunning-Kruger, Dunning right? Where there's a point in which they go, oh, that's too complex. It's got to be God. But if they understood more about it, if they, if they learn more about the process, to realize that, no, it doesn't make sense anymore for there to be a God to do it because this process can, number one, be explained thoroughly through physics. But more importantly, it gives rise to many weird things, things that are not, are very bad, right? Like mutations and diseases, cancers. So it's like, if there was a God, why would we? Why, why would they be? Why would this make cancer? Like that doesn't make any sense. Um, the flaws, the flaws of our DNA, right? DNA is a very flawed molecule. That, to me, um, allows me to comprehend why there's no designer. But again, people that are theists who don't have scientific understanding, they're going to automatically assume it's God because they're, they don't have the ability to comprehend the full picture. Um, here's ATP. You guys can, I mean, I, I'm not a biologist, but I can tell you that these are amazing things to look at. Amazing ways of visualizing how your cells work. Um, hello, Clarita, how are you? <laughs> All right, any questions? I'm tired of teaching right now. I'm, I got to take a break. I got to answer some questions. How far back is the sunlight for us? What do you mean? How far back is sunlight? What does that mean? Can you explain what's inside of a black hole and where do you go? <laughs> we don't know what's inside of a black hole. Nobody knows. But as far as we can see... Um, the possibility is that inside of a black hole is just a massive object, a very dense object, or maybe the black hole ripped space and time itself. There's a, it pokes a hole through space time and it leads you to another 
place in space time, right? It's like it's like a wormhole, right? Like an like an apple. Maybe a black hole is like when you're you're poking a hole through it, and you when you go through the black hole, you go out to another side, another place in the apple. Um, that's a possibility too. We don't know. Nobody knows, but it surely is amazing. Yes, but you would die if you went to a black hole. You would die before you even saw it. What was in there? First of all, because it's very hot, you have to traverse the uh, the accretion disk, which is extremely hot. You would vaporize. But more importantly, you would be stretched. If you could survive that, you'd be you'd be stretched like spaghetti. You'd be like this. You'd turn into like a spaghetti. <laughs> Because the reason why is because the black hole has so much gravity that your feet, if you went feet first, your feet will be we turned uh, will be stretched first before your head, and then the same will go for up for your your chest and your arms, and then your head will be all squeezed like spaghetti. Uh, but again, that would take place in like a fraction of a second. But that's the point. <sighs> You should explain that what the first organisms is like on Earth. Oh, they were just again molecules of RNA and protocells. I just explain, I just talked about that. In fact, let me let me get the evolution background. Do. So yeah, the first living things were right there. So you can see the top of the ladder. Um, you can see those are protocells. Those are basic protocells made of lipid molecules. Um, you know, a basic nucleus, maybe RNA, or well, likely RNA based. Um, and from there, you have DNA and more complex single celled organisms, um, flagellum, things like that. And then more complex multicellular life as you get towards the bottom of that stair, the first staircase. And then from there, worm like insects, um, and then fish, and then everything else. Oh, Google says eight minutes. Yeah, the sunlight takes about eight minutes to reach your eyes. So when, when you look at, don't look at the sun, but if you did, um, the sunlight that, that, we, that reaches our, your face took about eight minutes to get to your face. So you're looking at the sun as it was eight minutes ago. What was the first force behind the first ever life form? There was no force. It's just chemistry. You are a chemical machine. That's all. We are, we are chemical machines. That's all human. That's all life is. Life is, a, life is a process, not a thing. We are not alive because of the things we're made of but because of what they do, how they interact with each other. Life is not an object. There is no one thing that's alive. In fact, well, there's no one object itself that's alive. DNA is not living. DNA is a molecule. It's not alive. DNA is not a living molecule. There is no such thing as a living molecule. What makes you alive is not your DNA. But the way your DNA interacts with other molecules, the molecules within your DNA interact with each other and interact with other molecules. That's that process, that emergent process. And there's many. That is what makes you alive. Right? But the reason why you're living today is be the reason why you're alive, breathing and talking. It's because of the electrochemistry going through your body giving energy to your cells, which then interact with other things. It's, it, it's amazing if you understood what life is. It's quite amazing. You're falling in love with me? Oh, thank you. How do non-living particles create consciousness? Again, the same process. Consciousness is an emergent property of matter, right? Matter isn't conscious, but when you have enough matter in certain ways, in certain types of matter, interacting in certain ways, that's what makes you conscious.
Consciousness is the product of your neurons pr producing um, uh, electrochemical impulses. And those impulses can interact with other neurons, other synapses. And there's a network of these connections. And that's what thoughts are. Thoughts, your thoughts are the product of those interactions in your brain. Your thoughts are just those signals in your brain. Um, telling your, and they can tell your body what to do. Your, they go through your nerve endings, they go through your uh, body, and they tell your arms what to do, right? Right now, when I'm moving my arm, my brain is telling my arm to move, right? That's all. That's all that's happening. The signals that are produced in my brain are going sent, sent through, through my nerve endings to my arm, and my arm is moving. And my brain is a processor for my body. My brain processes my heart, my lungs. Well, those are natural. Those are instinctual. But the other part of your brain that is responsible for, you know, moving your muscles and your thing and your tendons and your things like that, that is more conscious and more aware. There's different phases your brain goes through. There's different stages of consciousness and awareness that your brain goes through. There's different stages of sleep, right? There's REM sleep. There's uh, all kinds of different stages. Your brain is a very complex mechanism. But it's not, there's no one matter. There's no one atom that, that makes you conscious. There's no one thing that makes you conscious. Consciousness is the sum total of all those interactions in your body. Life is the sum total of all those interactions in your body. The more you know, the less you know. Exactly. Exactly. That's the beauty of science. The beauty, the, way, the reason why science is so humbling is because it allows us to recognize how little we know. It's great to know things, but it's even greater to not know things in terms of knowing how much relative knowledge you don't have. That is a remarkable thing to understand, how much you don't know. You know, because when you're, when you're, you know, when you're ignorant on every and anything and most things, you're the, the, the parameter in which you think knowledge exists is much smaller, right? It's like you only think, you think, you know, a lot of things when you're ignorant, but when you're, when you know more, you realize how much you don't know. So. That's one of the best things about science. It it's, uh, gives us a, a lesson of humility, right? A lot of Christians are like, oh, humble yourself. No, it's the opposite. It's the scientist that's humble, not the Christian. The Christian thinks that they're the center of the universe, that they know everything because it's in a book that the creator made everything. And they, trust me, the creator did it. The, God did it. God did it. Trust me. Trust me. That's not humility. Humility is the scientist who goes, I don't understand this. Let's find out. Science cannot explain everything, but religion can explain nothing. Sure, science may not be able to explain everything. First of all, you don't know that. What if it can? What if science can explain everything? Then what? But more importantly, science may not be able to understand everything, but it works. It gets us technology. It works. Whereas religion will never do anything for us. It will never allow us to learn anything about the universe. It'll never work. Religion can explain nothing. It never will. That's the difference. That's the difference. Thank Christianity for advancing science. Absolutely not. Now, I'm not doubting that Christians have contributed to science, but Christianity itself isn't scientific. Christianity is, can't. It's incapable of contributing to science because Christianity is a, is a book. It's a story. That's all.
Oh, the toxic chat is in. Now we got the toxics here. <laughs> Inspiring philosophy already debunked you. Oh, really? So what was the verse in the Bible that, <laughs> that progressed science? <laughs> Show me the verse in the Bible that progressed science. Where is it? <laughs> Which verse was it? Was it the talking donkey verse? The the Adam and Eve verse, the Noah's Ark verse. Which which verse contributed to science and advanced science? Sparring philosophy is a complete nutcase. He doesn't know what he's talking about. And it, you're gullible enough to believe those people. The Big Bang is not a lie. It's a fact. We can see it. We observe it. Hmm. <laughs> Muhammad flied around the universe with a donkey. Guys, uh, science works. Religion doesn't. Get over it. If Christianity, if Christianity advanced science, then why isn't it advancing science now? Why did it stop advancing science? <laughs> Science can be possible without a God to start it. No, that's ridiculous. You don't need God. What started God? Right? What started God? We can ask this about God. What started God? Who made God? Who started God? Well, he doesn't need a starter. God was always there. Okay, then why can't we have the universe always be there? See? You're not answering anything by saying God did it. It doesn't solve anything. You don't solve the answers by saying God. That's not a solution. You're kicking the can down the road. You're just taking the problem and pushing it down the road. You're not actually solving it. Don't you get it? You can't just say God and, and go, yep, I win. God did it. No. How did it do it? How do you know it did it? And why do you need that to do it? Those are questions you have to answer before you can say. I know it's appealing to look around the world and say that there's got to be somebody doing it. I know that's so appealing to do. But unfortunately, you don't need it. It's not required. You don't need God. All you need are laws of nature. That's it. Nature itself. It just is. The universe can just be. That's it. You don't need a, a man or a narrative or a theistic idea. You just need a universe. And that's it. Yeah, if it turns out there's a God, great. Fantastic. But that was not a solution that we uh, had. If God exists, it was by chance. Not because we knew it or we had an evidence of it, but, but by chance, by luck, we happened to believe it. That's not to me, reliable way of truth. Science is a reliable way of truth because we can experiment, we can falsify, we can demonstrate things to be true in science. We don't just have to have faith. If you didn't, you wouldn't need faith if you had evidence of God. Put it that way. <laughs> science has been wrong about a million things. Religion has been wrong about everything. <laughs> you guys are knocking science, but it gives us the thing you're watching this on. Science gave us the phone you're using, the computer you're using, the internet you're using, the microwave you use, the refrigerator, the car you drive, the buildings you live in, the road you drive on, the rockets you see dry, uh, lift off the space. Science gave us all those things. What does religion give us? Plagues. Dark Ages, Crusades, War. <laughs> Vastly different things, people. Come on.
but guys, I, I'm not here to say there's no God. I just don't know what that is. Nobody does. It's a word. God is a conglomeration of ideas that are very personified, very human, right? He loves us. Think about what you think. Think about what you think God is. God is a male, right? We call him he or father. <laughs> He's a male. Oh, what a coincidence. He talks to you. Oh, what a coincidence. We talk to each other. He cares about you. Oh, what a coincidence. We care about each other. He loves you. Oh, what a coincidence. We love each other. He died for you. Oh, what a coincidence. People die for each other. Right? He made us. Oh, what a coincidence. We make things. Look at how similar God is to us. God is fearful. God is jealous, as the Bible says, right? He's, he, he, he hates people if they, do, if they do bad. He doesn't like you if you disobey him. If you don't believe in him, he hates you. Right? Think of how humanistic that is. Think of how human that is. Look, look at how easy it is to recognize the similarities between people and God. They're the same. God is nothing but an expression of our egos. It's egotistical to believe in God. He loves me. He died for me. It's all about you, 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 you. Everything's about you, 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 you. Yeah, he died for me. He loves me. He died. Guys, if you watch, if you understand the science, if you understand the, the cosmic perspective, you realize that there's no sign or evidence that the universe cares about us. Or if there's something out there that cares about us, we're nothing but a sideshow, if anything. We're not the main show of the universe. We're not the main stories, the main characters. We're a sideshow, if anything. We're like the we're like the, you know, actor number ninety seven. We're the custodian we're the custodians mopping the floor in the backstage. We're not the main show. We're not the main characters. There's more stars in the universe than grains of sand in all the beaches. There are more possibilities for life than life itself on the earth. And you think that God cares about what one species does on one pale blue dot? Come on. That seems to be a little bit pretentious. <laughs>